Hello, welcome to the third Executive Wine Seminar of the Vinidly International Academy. Here we are with Vinidly International in Shanghai at SEAL World of Wine. We're very happy to be here. My name is Ian D'Agata. I'm the director of the um, Vinidly International Academy and scientific advisor of Vinidly International. And our goal with the Vinidly International Academy is to create courses uh, that may help you appreciate Italian wines more, understand them more, our goal really is to broadcast, divulge, and explain the difference that are, that are Italian wines because they are complicated. And today, we are now going to do an advanced executive wine seminar, or what we call our master classes. The past two days, we did some introductory executive wine seminars, which are introductory levels to Italian wine. Today, we're going to do an advanced because we're going to focus on just one wine and just one area called Brunello di Montalcino. That's the wine, the area is Montalcino, a Tuscan wine that is 100% Sangiovese. And I think most of you know me by now. I'm the wine writer for Italy, Alsace, Bordeaux, and Canada for Steven Tanzer and his prestigious international wine cellar. I'm also in charge of Italy for uh, Decanter. I'm one of the main wine writers uh, there. And uh, I write books, and my most recent was The Native Wine Grapes of Italy, which is coming out in May uh, for the University of California Press. It's 650 pages with no drawings, no photos. So it's nothing but pure, pure information. And today we're going to talk about Brunello di Montalcino, one of Italy's most famous wines. Barolo would be the other one. Amarone is also famous. But certainly Brunello di Montalcino is the most famous. It's a relatively young red wine in that it didn't exist 300 years ago. It really was born only at the end of the uh, 19th century, in 1880, 1870, Brunello was being made. It was made from the Sangiovese grape, which is found all over Tuscany, but in Montalcino it seems to give a better, higher quality wine. And uh, Brunello di Montalcino, Brunello is the name of Sangiovese, locally Brunello, little brown one, because the grapes look brown. Uh, Brunello di Montalcino, 100% Sangiovese, that's aged at least two years in oak. It can also be a Reserva. And the great thing about this wine is that it grows in and around the town of Montalcino. But just like in Bordeaux, there are different areas to the Montalcino production zone, and the wines are going to be very different. So. Since Montalcino is a hill, the highest point of which is about 660 meters above sea level, there are grapes that grow on northern exposed vineyards and grapes that grow on southern exposed vineyards, and therefore these wines are going to be very different. So all the wines made in the northern side around the towns of Torrenieri, the towns of Borgo Conventi, those are going to be lighter, easier to appreciate sooner maturing wines. While the wines that grow in Castelnuovo dell'Abate, which is in the southeastern corner of Montalcino, or Sant'Angelo in Colle, southwestern part, or Camigliano, those are going to be much richer, fleshier wines. They're going to be very, very different, different than what you're used to. Remember that a good Sangiovese wine will always remind you will always remind you of small red berries, of red fruit, red cherries, strawberries, raspberries, a very flinty wine will remind you of licorice, will remind you of tea leaves. Only when it gets older does a Sangiovese wine remind you of tobacco and underbrush. That comes with time. Uh, so Brunello Montalcino, pure 100% Sangiovese wine. It can never be black. It should not be black. It cannot be. Now this is an advanced class. We've got to go a little bit more into detail. And you know that the pigments in grapes are five. They're called anthocyanins. Actually, they're anthocyanins. Um, anthocyanins are five basic pigments and they're common in all grapes and the proportion of each anthocyanin is different depending on the grape. That's genetically determined. Of the many anthocyanins, the deepest one, the one that gives you the darkest color, it's Malvedine. Malvedine is very common in Cabernet, for example. Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot were rich in Malvedine, which helps explain in part why those grapes are so dark. There's lots of Malvedine in Sangiovese, but in reality Sangiovese is also very rich in two other pigments called cyanine and peonine, and those are two that oxidize very easily. Since they oxidize, the color is not stable. First of all, they're not that dark. So all that means is Sangiovese will not be a pitch black wine, because it's made the color by anthocyanins that are going to oxidize and break down and give you an orangey color. Last but not least, Sangiovese does not have any 
acylated anthocyanins. What are conjugated anthocyanins? Anthocyanins are molecules that can be conjugated to other molecules, and usually they are conjugated to sugar molecules. And therefore you have uh, dicumorylate and acylate anthocyanins, depending on what gets attached to the anthocyan molecule. The most important of these conjugated anthocyanins are the acylated anthocyanins. And what you need to know is the Sangiovese does not have any. It has less than 1% acylated anthocyanins. Pinot Noir is another example. Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot have tons, 20, 30, 40%. So when in a wine you discover acylated anthocyanins, you know it cannot be 100% Sangiovese. That also explains why those wines are black, because the acylated or conjugated anthocyanins are very stable colors and they last long in time. So all this helps you understand why when you get a pure Sangiovese wine, as some of the great Brunellos we're going to drink now, they're going to be a beautiful red color. That does not mean that they're lesser wines. A wine does not have to be black to be good. It can in fact be a great red wine with a beautiful red color. And now we're going to go and taste some of the greatest wines Italy makes and they're all very great Brunello de Montalcinos. All right, our first wine is the Brunello de Montalcino by Il Marroneto. In reality, this is his top line wine called Madonna delle Grazie, a single vineyard. Now, Il Marroneto is an estate located right in the heart of Montalcino. You have to drive into the town in order to get to this estate. So it is actually in the cooler part of the Montalcino production zone, so the wines are always very high in acid, very delicate, very refined. The Madonna delle Grazie, which is a single vineyard, it's a little bit of a warmer microclimate, is a slightly bigger, richer wine, but still, this is really an example of an elegant, fresh, beautiful uh, archetypal Sangiovese. Il Marroneto is owned by Alessandro Mori, one of the nicest people you'll meet in Montalcino and certainly one of the biggest Sangiovese defenders that there are. His wines speak of Sangiovese as this wine does. It's a beautiful red color with maybe with ruby tinges, an amazing nose, a smorgasbord if you will, of red fruit, cinnamon, nutmeg, licorice, Beautiful, it's a little bit of a gun flint, but it's just a pure Sangiovese nose. When you drink it, you got really high acidity, but it's harmonious. This crunchy red fruit and a little bit of flinty salinity on the back. It's a very good wine, it's a very rich wine. It's much richer than the entry level Brunello Il Maronero makes. It ages very well, and it's really one of the really great, great Brunello di Montalcinos. Uh, Alessandro Mori does really strong work there. He's very interested in safeguarding uh, Brunello and Sangiovese and this wine's really uh, an excellent standard bearer for the whole appellation. Wine number two is by Silvio Nardi. It's actually a young lady who makes the wines it's another 2009. I should point out the first four wines we're going to have in this tasting are from the 2009 vintage. In reality, today we're going to have wines from 2009 and 2008. Now, both these two vintages have been criticized in the press, but I think that's a mistake. Neither one of the two is going to be a vintage of the century. Certainly, 2010 looks to be a truly great stellar Brunello vintage, but the fact is, 2008 and 2009 are just wonderful. 2008 are wines that have very high acidity and very light frames, very elegant wines. 2009 are richer, riper, and depending on which zone of Montalcino they were made in, they can be remarkably good. I just wrote something on Brunello Montalcino 209 for Decanter, and we thought that they were excellent wines. This by Silvia Nardi. Silvia Nardi is Silvio Nardi is an estate that is located in the northwestern corner of Montalcino. And so this wine is made with vineyards located a little bit everywhere. It's a blend. But again, you're going to see a perfect Brunello de Montalcino, bright red. You're going to have this lovely nose of small red berries and of herbs like marjoram and uh, 
Yeah, marjoram, maybe sage. A little bit of mintiness here. Again, it's a very light red fruit aroma. Mm. And in the mouth, you have this very flinty, very fresh Sangiovese based wine. Almost painful acidity. Um, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not too tough, but it certainly is a very acidic wine that really requires food. The acidity is, however, harmonious. It's not disjointed. It's not an ugly acidity. This is an acidity that, when you eat food with it, will will get much better. This is an excellent entry level Brunello di Montalcino. I think it's one of the best she's made in a while, actually. Uh, redolent with red fruit, lovely acidity, uh, very young. This is a wine actually that will age possibly even better than the than the Madonna delle Grazie that we had earlier. So this is a really a great, great wine as far as entry-level Brunellos go. This is beautiful. And it gives you an idea, since the grapes come from many different sites, of just how good the whole Brunello di Montalcino production zone can be. Good stuff. Wine number three is what I call uh, a perfect Brunello di Montalcino. In other words, it's a synthesis of the first wine, the Madonna delle Grazie, and the second wine, the Silvio Nardi, because this has elements of both. It has the creamy fleshiness of the Il Marroneto Madonna delle Grazie, and remember what I told you, the entry-level uh, Il Marroneto is not at all creamy and fleshy. It's actually very high in energy and acid. But um, this falls in between the Il Maroneto, Il Maroneto, Madonna delle Grazie, and the Silvio Nardi, which is a simpler, more straightforward wine. Moccoli is much riper and fleshier, already on the nose. You can tell that when you drink this wine, uh, there's going to be a much richer mouthfeel. And it is like that, in fact. It's a wine that has a very good nose palate correspondence. Again, it's a very good Brunello, because it's very pure Montalcino Sangiovese. You have this ripe red fruit that still has a, a very high acidic backbone. So little red cherries, little red raspberries, strawberries with high acidity. I'm really salivating here. This just makes you want to eat. This just goes absolutely well with steak and grilled foods of all kind. It's a very good wine because it's very long and very balanced. This is a very clean wine with no excessive under underbrush, licorice, tobacco notes which sometimes can be bothersome. Mokali is an up-and-coming estate. Ten years ago their wines maybe were not as sought after as they are today and this is a perfect example from a very good year, 2009, of what they can do. So I heartily endorse this one because it's a lovely, lovely wine. Well, wine number four is by perhaps Italy's most famous producer, Antonori. You know, everybody knows Antonori. They've been making wine for over 700 years. They own Prunotto in, in Piedmont, uh, Castello della Sala in Umbria. They make a gazillion different Chianti Classicos and Vino Nobiles alla La Bracesca. And uh, also make a wonderful Brunello Montalcino at their Antonori estate, Pian delle Vigne. Pian delle Vigne, where they make an everyday Brunello Montalcino, and they make also a new one called Vigna Ferrovia, which is a cru and it's a great, great wine. You know, when I drink this in 2009 with Pian delle Vigne, it just strikes home at how much these wines have improved. The Antonori estate, Pian delle Vigne, always made decent Brunello Montalcino, but I think it's in the last few years that they've really improved by leaps and bounds. This 2009 is a thing of beauty. It has a beautiful red color, again, no needlessly dark tones. It has a very ripe, almost decadent red cherry nose with nutmeg and cinnamon. It's just a beautiful nose. Maybe even a hint of orange peel and quinine. And then in the mouth, it's brightly tannic, it's fresh. Maybe not the longest Brunello we've had today, um, but certainly very young, very youthfully chewy and ought to become a really good wine.
All right, well, you know, wine number uh, five is a very great estate, Canalicchio di Sopra. It's an important estate in Montalcino because it's in the northern end of the hill, and therefore these are finer, more refined wines. In fact, they have vineyards in the Montosoli area, which is the best area considered uh, for, Mon for Brunello wines in the northern part of the Montalcino production zone. So it's a very high quality area, they're very high quality wines. Um, this one here again is going to be a bright red color, maybe with red ruby. And licorice, ton of licorice here, you can really tell. But it's a very good example of a lighter style Brunello, a Brunello that is born in the northern reaches reaches of the Appalachians. It's a much easier to take, smoother, fresher Brunello and um, this is a very good example of the northern side of Brunello's there are fresh, light and lively on the palate, it really dances there it makes you salivate a lot so it's probably going to be better with food but this is just a lovely food wine, really very good wine Okay, wine number six is by Frescobaldi, one of the most famous estates in Italy, like Antinori. They've also been at this for 600 years. This is from their Castel Giocondo estate. They also make another Brunello called Luce. The grapes are always from the Castel Giocondo estate. Um, Castel Giocondo is a beautiful property. They've, uh, um, they've invited a lot of people over there during the years, and it's a beautiful estate and the wines are getting better and better. Casal Giocondo is um, a serious Brunello in that we can already tell from the color it's very dark. It's not um, abysmally dark, so we can accept that color. It has a beautiful nose also, of typical Brunello underbrush and uh, herbs. And most importantly, finer tannins than usual on the mouth. Castel Giocondo is in the north uh, western side of Montalcino. It's actually more to the center. So it really straddles an area that is in between the northern part of the northwestern area and the southern part of the southwestern area, where you have um, Sant'Angelo in Scalo and these other places where the Brunellos historically have always been very famous. So this is caught somewhere in between, and yet the wines are very, very good and very, very helpful. Now, they need to work on reducing the tannic cloud in this wine, but as it is, it's a great wine, and this will uh, find lots of success with roast meats and stews of all kinds. All right, so wine number seven is a great estate. Il Poggione is one of the best Brunello producers of it all because, you know, they make over 200,000 bottles of this wine. So, you know, when you make a wine this good, if you make a couple of barriques or 600 bottles, you and I could probably be good at making the wine. But here they're making 200,000 bottles of this, and that's very, very impressive. Now, the Il Poggione vineyard is down in the southwestern uh, part of Montalcino from Sant'Angelo in Colle, going down Sant'Angelo in Scalo. It's a very warm area with winds coming from the sea, very rich, much riper sort of soil. So the Sangiovese really takes on these ripe characteristics of, of fruit rather than stay more mineral. And it's a beautiful wine as always has uh, gorgeous aromatics of uh, spices and cinnamon and nutmeg. And what's really great about Il Poggione is that it has very fine tannins. Castel Giocondo is a very good wine, the one we had before, but it has slightly harsh tannins because of the area it's in. They're in an area where the tannins tend to be a little less fine than those of Il Poggione. Il Poggione was once part of a much bigger estate called the Franceschi estate which was divided at the end of the 60s in this estate 
and the wine we're gonna have next, Cold Orcha. So Cold Orcha and Il Pugione were once part of the same big estate. I think that Il Pugione with this wine has done very, very well. It's a 2008. Now, you gotta remember that the um, Frescobaldi and the Canalicchio di Sopra that we had earlier were both 2008s. 2008 is a much more mineral year, it's a much more cooler year, so you don't get quite the fleshy opulence that you had in 2009. You have a lot more steeliness and a lot more mineral. Uh, and this number seven wine, Il Pugione, certainly has lots of the flinty minerality that others lacked. Well, the second last wine is a Burrando di Montalcino by Col Dorcia. Col Dorcia, another very famous estate in Montalcino, again one of the top 15 or 20. It's actually in the southwestern corner, like the previous wine, Il Poggione. In fact, Il Poggione is a bit north and um, uh, Col Dorcia is a bit south. Col Dorcia, the grapes grow in between Sant'Angelo in Colle and Sant'Angelo Scalo, the two little towns of the southwestern area of Brunello. The wines are always very fleshy and very opulent, and this is a very nice nose. It's uh, spicy and uh, and uh, and nice to to smell for somebody who's been ill. In the San in the Sant'Angelo in Colle, Sant'Angelo Scalo area where Cold Orcha is located, you have much creamier, much fleshier, much richer fruit flavors. It is red fruit, but it's not necessarily sour red fruit anymore. It's more like red cherry, strawberry, and, ch and um, raspberry. This is a much bigger, fuller wine. It is very similar to Pugione, the wine that we just had. What I want you to notice, if you still have your wines in the glass and you want to go back, you should really try the number eight difference with, for example, the number five or the number three. They're all very good wines, but what you will notice is that this one's much chunkier and bigger, as it's normal with cold orcha. It comes from a very rich, hot area, and it's great. It's a very good wine. Mm -hmm. And our last wine of the tasting today is actually one of the most recent Brunellos to come on the market, Madonna Nera. Madonna Nera if we had done this tasting 10 years ago, we couldn't have done it with Madonna Nera because they didn't exist. Madonna Nera has bought itself its vineyard and uh, its facility and makes a very good solid wine in a much richer, fleshier mode. So it's an ideal continuation with the wines of Il Poggione and Col Dorcia because this is just as big, if not bigger than they are. And you have a little bit of an inky quinine note here, but always the violet a Sangiovese note you'd expect. In the mouth it's fresh, it's elegant, very smoothly tannic. It's a very good example that of a good terroir for Sangiovese because Sangiovese is a difficult finicky grape. If you grow it in areas where the soils aren't perfect or the climate isn't perfect, you will get tough rigid tannins. That is not the case with this wine, which is beautifully smooth and fleshy and almost opulent. It almost has a very ripe red cherry compote nose, much bigger. But what I want you to do is I want you to go back to your other wines and if you remember wine number one and wine number two, you will see how different the Brunellos from the northern side to the southern side are. And Madonna Nera is very much an example of the southern side so much more similar to wines 8 and 7 than it is to wines 1 or 2. They're all made with 100% Sangiovese, but they are in fact different wines. Madonna Nera has been making some Tuscan wines recently and they've all been very good, but this is really one of their best efforts to date. Again, these last uh, five wines are from the 2008 vintage, which is a much fresher, cooler vintage. It is not as fresh, fleshy and opulent as the 2009s that we began the tasting with. In 2008, you're getting high acidities. Wines are going to last longer. Uh, not necessarily all that concentrated and complex. 
So I'm not sure there are going to be that many reservas in 208, but I think 208 is a very good everyday restaurant wine or quaffing wine for somebody who wants a bigger boned wine, a Brunello with real meat, but still easier to accept and easier to understand now that, um, now that uh, it's already five years old and in another five years these will be drinking perfectly. You know Brunello can last 30-40 years so if you were to get a 1955 Brunello today that had been kept in a very good cellar it would still be very good today but um, 2008 is certainly a vintage that will last and last and last more than 2009. Alright so here we are nine great Brunello di Montalcinos, one of Italy's most famous wines like Barolo, like Amarone um, wines that age extremely well you know there's still a couple of 1891 and 1898 wines out there that are still available. Uh, Brunello di Montalcino, what are we going to take away from today's lecture? What do you need to know or learn? First of all, great Brunello di Montalcino is never black. It does not have the pigments for that, so it has to be red. All the wines today, very good wines, were in fact red. The second thing is that Brunello di Montalcino should be made with ripe grapes, so they will remind you of sour red cherries and flowers, uh, but they can also remind you of richer red grapes and tar and underbrush but it really shouldn't ever remind you of black uh, pepper and and cedar and graphite that would be strange there are a mix of very good young producers and very old producers in Montalcino so you have young producers like Il Marroneto and Canlicchio di Sopra that are or even Madonna Nera which is a recent arrival very good wines and then you have the classics like Il Poggione and Coldorcia that are simply unbeatable they're very big fleshy round rich ripe wines that everybody loves so Brown de Montalcino a beautiful red wine red color typical of Tuscany will age forever the 2009's I would drink sooner today um, I would wait another five years for them and I would drink them within ten years so I would say the 2009's can really uh, be drunk and enjoyed from 2017 to 2025. The 2008s, I think, are much longer lived. They're fresh, they're high in acid. So I would drink the 2008s sometime between 2018 and 2035. I hope you enjoyed these Brunello Montalcinos as much as I have. It's a very good example of what Brunello can do and especially a very good example of what Sangiovese, when it's pure, can deliver. Thanks everyone.